Hello, I'm Karen Pascal. I'm the Executive Director of the Henry Nouwen Society. Welcome to a new episode of Henry Nouwen, Now and Then. Our goal at the Society is to extend the rich spiritual legacy of Henry Nouwen to audiences around the world. We invite you to share these podcasts with your friends and family. Because we're new to the world of podcasts, taking time to give us a review or a thumbs up will mean a great deal to us and will help us extend our reach to more people. This week, singer-songwriter Carolyn Ahrens is my guest. Carolyn has released 14 albums and is the author of three critically acclaimed books. Fifteen of Carolyn's songs have become top ten radio singles on the Canadian pop charts and in the U.S. Christian charts. Ahrens has earned two Dove Awards, three Juno nominations, and was recognized as the West Coast Music Awards Songwriter of the Year. In addition to her busy touring schedule, Carolyn has been a regular columnist for Christianity Today, Faith Today, and CT Women. She has also served as an adjunct professor at a number of universities. Currently, Carolyn is the Director of Education for Renovari, a far-reaching organization that encourages and nurtures spiritual renewal. In this capacity, a few years ago, Carolyn reached out to us at the Henry Nouwen Society and said that Renovari wanted to do a book study for their worldwide community using one of Henry Nouwen's books. Carolyn, let's start there. Which one of Henry's books did you choose? Well, I will tell you in one second, but first let me say thank you so much for that introduction and for having me on the podcast. I have been listening to it and enjoying it so much and it's just just been so looking forward to this conversation. But to answer your question, um, we could have chosen many, many of Henry's books for, for our book club, but we went with The Wonderful Life of the Beloved. Now that has got to be uh, my favorite book. It really is. And yeah. when I give the first book to somebody, I give that one. I love mm -hmm. it. Yeah. How was the book received? Oh, it was received just like you would expect, just like a, an oasis in the desert. People loved it so much. We had um, Deidre Lanau uh, help guide us through the book, wonderful friend of the society, I know. Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, in, in our work at, at Renovari, one, one of the things we try to encourage people is that they can be intentional in their life with God, that there are these kind of spiritual practices and rhythms available to us um, that we can use to open ourselves up to God's, the flow of God's life and love and his desire to transform us, to heal us, to make us holy. But what we've learned is that if we don't start with a, a picture of God that is as, you know, hints at how good and beautiful and loving he is, and a picture of ourselves or a core identity of ourselves as his beloved, if we don't start there, then any sort of effort towards spiritual formation goes horribly awry. You know, William Temple said, if a person's picture of God is, is off, then the more religious they become, the worse it gets. And um, so we always have to start with that core identity as the beloved of God, that there's absolutely nothing we can do to earn that or change that. And that anything we do in our life with God flows out of that rather than striving to earn earn God's love. And um, so that's always kind of our mission to help the people we serve and help ourselves continue to bake that into our core identity. And there's just nobody better than Henry, I don't think. And that book, Life of the Beloved, uh, is just sort of the, the, the absolute top manual or, or guide or help on, yeah, baking that in our identity as the beloved is just so, so helpful. Can I ask you, from, from your experience, uh, have the writings and, and teachings of Henry Nouwen impacted your spiritual journey before you did this, this study? Well, tell me a little bit about what you've been reading and, and how it impacted you. Yeah, you know, Henry has felt like a friend. I never met him in, in person. I, I envy that you did. Um, uh, but he has felt like a friend and a mentor and a kind of spiritual director for years and years in my own life with God. And um, I was trying to remember where it started. And then it made me smile to realize that long time ago, way before I worked for Renovari, 
I had come across a Renovari resource called uh, Devotional Classics. And it was in that resource that I first met Henry, I think. Um, th that resource is uh, it's a, a collection of, of just excerpts from great devotional writing from throughout the centuries, really from 2000 years. And it includes an excerpt from Henry uh, from his book, Making All Things New. And it's an excerpt on solitude. And I think it was you know, I'd sort of come out of an evangelical kind of upbringing and hadn't heard much about the contemplative life with God, about the invitations of solitude and silence. We, I came from a pretty wordy kind of um, way of being with God. And um, that excerpt kind of stopped me in my tracks. And there's a, there's a little section in that uh, from Making All Things New where he talks about um, our spiritual deafness and moving from deafness to a more listening, receptive kind of way of going through life and being open to God. And he does this cool thing where he links, um, our word for deaf comes from a Latin word uh, that also gives us the word absurd. And our word for listening comes from a Latin word that also gives us the word for obedience. So he does this movement that like, like by cultivating a listening life, uh, we move from an absurd life, a chaotic life where nothing coheres and we can't find any meaning to this kind of resonant, obedient, um, flourishing life. And that that hit me so hard. And I and I realized, you know, you mentioned I've done 14 albums and the first one was called I Can Hear You. And it was all about learning to listen and detect, you know, God kind of clearing his throat in the stuff that goes on around us. <laughs> All the way to my most recent one is called Recognition, and it's about recognizing when God is moving and, and speaking, and Henry has helped me so much with that. So that's that's where it started uh, with Henry and me. And then I think the first full-length book I read of his was The Genesee Diary, and I remember just kind of being astonished at his honesty and his candor in that book, and... Um, yeah, just his willingness to talk about his own struggle, his own need for affirmation that really mapped onto my journey so much. And and I have to say, in a way, you know, Henry's life almost felt like a rebuke to me in some way. And let me let me try to <laughs> unpack that a little bit. This brilliant man who ends up working in a community with disabled folks, it that that trajectory bothered me when I first heard about it. And you know, we're always saying now that I work at Renovari, we're always saying now, pay attention to your resistances. You know, whatever sort of bugs you, there's a, there's an invitation there. It's it, There's something for you to learn there. And I realized, yeah, his, his um, he was, you know, I, I know he was called to that community for many beautiful reasons, but also for this rejection of the false self, for this intentionality to move into a community that would have no interest in affirming him on all the uh, in all the measures where he would normally be affirmed man that's powerful that uh, that i have come back and back to that and it has been sort of like a uh a, a burr in my saddle and a and a light for my path. You know, it's amazing. So that's part of my journey with my friendship with the, this Henry who I never met. And then of course, Life of the Beloved uh, has meant so much to me and, and my community. And then another, another book I've found so helpful uh, is his book on leadership in the name of Jesus. And again, his kind of, his rejection um, or his invitation to say no to the temptation, to the need to be relevant or spectacular or powerful, just so, so helpful. I can imagine for, uh, it's, it's almost the antithesis, isn't it? For a, a performer, you, you want to be liked, you want to be, you want to be applauded. I mean, you, you, yeah. you stretch yourself out and there's such daring in, in offering up a new song. There's such daring in offering up an article or a book and you want somebody to give you the big A plus on it. <laughs> and um, yes. I, I agree. Henry, Henry has undone a lot of us in that whole area because it is so close to the bone. It's so close to the, the issues of the heart where in a way he takes us back to knowing that if we don't know we're beloved, We'll just be performing, jumping yeah. through hoops, trying to impress. And ultimately, the, the one that isn't impressed is ourselves because we don't believe it. So going back and finding that solid sense, God 
sees me as lovable and loves me well. And, yeah. and Henry brought that gift to so many. Mm-hmm. Um, I, and I'm, I'm delighted. I'm, I'm just delighted as I discover your work. It's funny because you remind me of Henry. I was really struck by the fact the Henry that I know processed everything through his pen, good, bad, or wonderful. You know, he would write about it. He'd think about it, but his pen became the tool where he, he was kind of working his way through what he was, what he was dealing with. And, um, I, I see that in you. I mean, he, who produces 14 albums and all these wonderful articles and books? You're obviously processing a lot because there's uh, the other thing that I see in it is it, that it's full of honesty. That reminds me of Henry as well. So uh, kudos to you. Bravo that you're doing that. I, I, I'm loving it. <laughs> I have to admit in the last week or so, I've been immersing myself in your music because I wanted to sort of listen freshly to this voice that I first heard 20 years ago, is it 2025? I'm not quite sure when they, you know, when you came on the scene, but I know that we were all so impressed and I wanted to hear what you were doing now. And what I found is that you um, have this incredible gift of nurturing the spirit. You're speaking to people's spirits and oh my goodness, some of the things are just focusing on what you've brought in the last couple of years during the pandemic, the kind of work you've brought forward, it's real food for hearts that have been tested and changed and challenged and hurt. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about this. Um, tell me about what you have been creating in these last couple of years. I mean, clearly people got cut off, had to stay home. What did you do with your at-home time? Right. Well, first, let me say, um, you are, uh, to go back to something you said a minute ago, you're absolutely right that I process the world by, by writing either, either columns or articles or, or songs. You know, I always commend journaling to everyone else, but I'm terrible at journaling, but I can do it if it's a, if it's a writing assignment or a, a songwriting assignment. Um, and if that makes me a little bit like Henry, that's that's <laughs> wonderful. It's definitely writing is is uh, sort of a form of prayer, and and I think too, um, I grew up incredibly shy, and writing was sort of how I got in touch with kind of my own voice. Um, so I'm grateful for that. But yeah, in this pandemic time. Um, I did get kind of seized by a creative wave for which I'm very grateful. Uh, I had, uh, I started working at Renovari six years ago. And so up until the time I took the job at Renovari, I had released 12 albums. And, uh, and then in that whole time at Renovari, just have loved, loved, loved and continue to love my work there. Continue to use music there, like a language that I speak. Um, well, it is, a, it is, a, I only speak the two languages, unfortunately, just English and music. I wish I spoke some other languages too. Um, but you know, I didn't really feel a drive to, to do more recordings or write a bunch more music. Um, but when COVID hit, uh, so I still had my work at Renovari, but it all went virtual, like, like so many of us have learned to do over the last couple of years. But I had a little bit more margin because there was so much less travel. And then I think the sort of presenting a cause when when this creative wave came up to writing a bunch more new music was actually like here in Canada, the Gospel Music Association here, they were doing a little award show and they were uh, taking a song from my very first album, a song called Seize the Day, and putting it in their Songwriter Hall of Fame, which was really nice. And um, it was right at the beginning of the pandemic, so the show was going to be live, and then they had to take it, you know, quickly adapt and make it a Zoom show. And so I had this opportunity to give a little little acceptance speech with this song going into uh, into the Hall of Fame. And I became suddenly aware that I was talking to all these artists, musicians, who really were facing something quite terrifying. You know, most of them, uh, unlike me, don't have another job and um, rely on touring to feed their families. And so I was aware that that this was very serious for them to suddenly be grounded. And it brought to mind sort of the Old Testament passages uh, about exile. What do you do when you find yourself in exile? And COVID seemed to me to be a kind of exile. And so I started thinking about in Jeremy, uh, Jeremiah 29, when uh, God, through 
through the prophet is giving some coaching about what you should do when when you're in exile and he, and he says well when you're in exile you 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 build houses you plant gardens and you seek the welfare of the city and so i was saying to these musicians that i knew that were on this zoom call okay this is your time to to plant gardens and seek the welfare of the city and what does it look like for a, a songwriter for a musician for any kind of artist to to plant a garden. Well, it, it, it probably means creating, growing some things, or at least tending to the earth, you know, doing, doing the kinds of things that cultivate uh, growth. And so I give this, you know, I felt like it was quite a stirring little charge on this Zoom call. And then I hung up and I thought, well, what about you, Aaron? So you haven't, you haven't been growing much, you know, <laughs> what's your deal? And uh, so I had a I had a little conversation with the Lord about that and said, you know, okay, well, I'm open if you want to plant anything. I, I don't seem to have a a ton of control over when um, sort of a creative wave comes. Um, and for a few weeks, not, not much was happening. But the first thing I noticed that was that I was starting to really fall in love with music again. I was starting to listen to uh, other other people's music, different passages of music, and just like could feel this fire warming up in my heart of like, oh, this music is the best. <laughs> listen to that. Listen to that bass line. Listen to what's happening here. Something started to kind of thaw out and, and kindle and warm up. And then uh, before I knew it, I was plunged into this uh, season of deep creativity. And it's really the mercy of God that I don't I don't get this, these seasons very often because I become completely useless as a functional human being. I My family knows, oh, okay, we're not going to get dinner made for a few weeks now. And, um, but yeah, songs just started coming sort of as, as fast as they could come. And, uh, you know, the end of the story is I ended up recording not one, but two, two new projects during, during COVID and it ended up being a very sort of a live creative time for which I'm grateful and acknowledge that for many people, COVID has been just a miserable time. So I, I don't mean to, um, minimize that, but I'm certainly grateful that I experienced this creative wave. Well, I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful. Like uh, the recognition album, for example, it has some pieces in it. Like everyone sits by their own pool of tears. I mean, you and you actually undid me with that particular song. Mm. And um, I love I love the lines that are on the cover of the album. I thought you were mostly incognito. I could not have been more wrong. The whole universe is your cathedral. And every heartbeat is your song. The pool of tears one, it, it just pulls us to compassion. I, I, I was very moved by that. And then I had read the story. It's my honor to cry for you. I read the little story that you've written about that. But that song simply undid me, to be quite honest. And I know for yourself, you've had to address grief. You've had to go there. Uh, probably some of Henry's strongest writings come from his addressing grief. Um, would you... Huh be willing to share just a little bit about what you discovered? Because I found it was really interesting what you had been stepping away from and then had right. to step into. Yeah, thank you for asking about that. So that was probably the other part of me not writing for a few years was the loss of my mom in, uh, we're almost coming up on the three-year anniversary of that, October 22nd, 2018. And uh, my mom really was my best friend. And I, I know not everyone gets that. So I'm, I'm very grateful for that. But very, we were very, very close. And um, I knew that to lose her would be hard, but I underestimated sort of how seismic it would be for me and really didn't have, really did not know how to grieve well. I had lost my dad and that was very hard, but for whatever reason, um, this time, this loss, hit me in a way that I didn't really know how to process or respond to. And I kept, you know, I kept doing this thing where I would think, well, losing losing your mom is sad, but she was getting older and she had a lot of health issues. So it, it wasn't tragic. I mean, I have friends who have lost, you know, kids and lost people out of season. And, and I, so I kept thinking, you know, compared to them that you know, this, I don't have a right um, to be as undone by this as I am which is not a very helpful way of thinking about it. But uh, I can, so I kept running away, running away um, from my grief and it, and it was really doing damage to my soul. And um, then a couple things happened. One was I finally went to a grief counselor 
woman named Penny. And she said, okay, first of all, this sliding scale grief thing, that's not that's not doing you any good. You have to just, you have to, you don't compare your grief to anybody else's. Your grief is your grief and you have to walk through it. Um, and so she actually gave me an assignment to take 30 minutes a day specifically for grieving, which was about the most horrible thing I could think of. But she thought if I would create some space for it and allow myself to to grieve, it would help me. And as it turns out, it really did. And then the second thing that happened was I got asked to go sing it at a, a funeral for another mon- mother, uh, the wife of a drummer friend of mine who had died quite suddenly. And at the funeral, her son, Jordan, got up to give the eulogy, young, young adult, uh, very bravely got up to give the eulogy. And he said, okay, everybody, if you're wondering if Jordy is going to cry, of course I'm going to cry. It is my honor to cry for her. <sighs> With that one line, he completely reframed my grief for me and made me realize, oh, this is part of how I love my mom. You know, she's she, she lives still. She lives on the other side. Uh, but this is part of how I love my mom. This is hard and holy work. This is part of how I honor my parents in my particular case. And... Um, you know, I think it was Thomas Lynch who said, grief is the tax we pay on loving. But it's also, it's also the, the invitation to continue to love well, even after the separation of death. And there, it is part of, you know, I think back to Henry, he was always inviting us to become fully human. And grief is the absolute ultimate training ground for becoming uh, fully human. And so it's been, it's been slow. I still have a tendency to run away from, from things that feel like they might swallow me up, but I'm learning, um, that part of becoming fully human is learning to grieve well, that it's hard and holy work, and that it's a kind of emblem or sacrament of the love that my mom and I have between us. So that's where that song comes from. And, uh, and then if I can tell you about where the song Pool of Tears comes from. So To Cry For You is very much about my own personal grief journey. And then Pool of Tears tells the story of a variety of people who are sitting next to their own pool of tears. And there is one one of the things I get to do at Renovari is I oversee something called the Renovari Institute, um, which is a two-year deep dive into spiritual formation. And uh, we use Henry's writings in, in that program quite a bit. They're a huge gift to us there. And we have one of our faculty members is a guy named Trevor Hudson. And he lives in South Africa. He has a wonderful South African accent. And he actually, this is an aside, but an important one. He, at the Institute, our first, um, we meet for these week-long residencies at retreat centers. And he's an important teacher at those. And when we're working with this question, we work with three big questions in the first course. And they're, what is my picture of God? What is my picture of the gospel and what is my picture of myself? And when Trevor is helping us teach, what is my picture of myself? He reads that portion from Life of the Beloved where Henry is asked to bless uh, one of the residents uh, uh, where he's living, Janet, and then everybody ends up coming up for a blessing. And Trevor reads that story and then he offers a blessing over our students. And it's always, you know, 45 very accomplished people who've come to learn more and they're always just a mushy, sobby mess uh, by the end of that blessing. So Henry continues to bless us in the, in the Institute. But Trevor, Trevor, this faculty member, he tells a story that he did an internship in Washington, D.C. when he was training to become a Methodist minister. And he loved the, the pastor that, that he was training with. And when he left to fly back to South Africa, he said to this pastor, I just love the way you minister to people do you have a word for me? He had this idea from the early uh, desert dwellers of that you could go to, to a spiritual mentor and you could say, do you have a word for me? So he said to this pastor, do you have a word for me? And the pastor said, yes, Trevor, never forget that every single person you meet sits next to his or her own pool of tears. And that was very early in Trevor's development as a pastor, and it's completely shaped, like, this is why I want you to get to know him, because it's completely shaped 
this empathetic, um, deeply, deeply compassionate presence that he is in the world. So in his honor, I wrote this song, Pool of Tears, just just helping us remember that every person we run into, including that person who's acting in a way we don't understand and might make us feel initially angry, that person is sitting next to his or her own pool of tears. I loved it. There's another song on that album that I just love. After this, I think it's my favorite. Ah. Um, you, we, it, it's really, um, it's about the now moment we're living through. And, it, and you've captured it so beautifully. We've never in our lifetime known a shadow like this one. Still, however long this nighttime, rest assured the dawn will come. After this, the sun will be shining and all we miss will come to us in a whole new light. And may we never waste the gift of a warm embrace. It's lovely. Um, mm. I I just, the, the song is rich with you, the lessons you've learned or you've captured. I'd love to hear from you what this time has taught you, Carolyn. Well, thank you. Yeah, you know, that song was part of sort of the initial um, creative wave in this COVID time. I have a, a duo partner named Spencer Capier, who plays sort of anything with strings, violin, mandolin, all, all different kinds of mandolins, guitar bazooki uh amazing guy we've been working together for years and years and uh before i had written anything in this COVID time he let me hear this little violin melody he'd written this fiddle tune and he had called it after this and it was kind of his way of processing and you know you were talking about me processing with a pen he was processing with his violin uh the experience of COVID, and it was just beautiful and and so of course i said hey can i try to put some words to this and you know kind of turn it into a a a lyrics and music song and he said yeah go for it so so i did and and yeah my desire was to say you know number one we're gonna get through this but number two let's pay attention to what we really miss in this season and let's let it cultivate kind of a holy longing and reverence in us for things we have taken for granted like being able to just hug somebody when you run into them on the street you know or or eat eat together with people who aren't in your bubble and um you know all that stuff just i think we've learned how sacred human touch is and seemingly incidental human connection is and 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 my goodness singing together and you know something like like church where where before i might have uh, i confess in the spirit of the genesee diary i confess sometimes you know would not always enter into say corporate worship in a church service the way i should i mean the first time uh we had a, a full worship service again in our church was it which was in the summer for about that week when we were allowed to relax remember there was about a week where we could have our masks off and be together um I I wept. I just wept and wept and wept at the gift of standing with a group of people and singing worship together in a way that I would not have understood the value of before. So so I wanted to say with that song, both of those things, there will be an after this, this too shall pass. You know, there's, there's something on the other side of this. But also let's, let's really notice what we're missing and what we're longing for. And, um, and learn and learn to reverence in it in a way where we won't be so careless with it in the future. That's at least what I have needed to tell myself uh, through this season. And hopefully a bit of that came out in the song. Oh, I, I love the song. It's interesting for us to realize that we are sharing a moment with the whole world. Sometimes, oh, yeah. you know, uh, maybe living through the last few years of a lot of discord, we were maybe sharing it through, you know, through the Western world or through North America or, or the United States. But this is a moment we've shared with the world. And I, I do hope it will make us more profoundly compassionate. You know, our humanness, really. I, you know, I love that. And I love you recently on the podcast, you ran a talk from Henry from sometime in the 80s, right, about fear. And he, it really struck me when he started talking about that to be connected to the heart of God's love is to be connected to every human being uh, globally. And he kept using this word solidarity. And 
uh, you were so wise to pick that talk and run it now, because if we're not awake to our solidarity now, well, the whole world goes through the same thing. We're never going to wake up to it. So this is, I think that's one of the divine invitations in this time. You've really diagnosed that well, that there's this invitation to realize, yeah, we, this, we're all human in this together and there is such deep there should be such deep solidarity so thank you for that well i i treasure the album and uh, and and i will be giving it as a gift to others because it's music that i think is very it just goes right into the heart now the other album i also enjoyed the the Thanks. one that came out of this time in the morning Oh my goodness, what a call to worship. And yet it's not to me, it's not a call for out there. I feel like it's so personal. I feel like this one, there there were songs in this that just pull me forward into the presence of God just personally. Mm. I loved it. And it made me want to know, you know, how do you use music like this? Do you have a quiet time? What works for you? Yeah. It doesn't necessarily work for everybody, but what works for you? (laughs) Right. What works for you? Yeah. Well, so the second album that you've mentioned in the morning, so the recognition album that we were just talking about is all new original songs that mostly came out of this uh, season. And then in the morning, uh, there's actually only one original song on that album. Um, and the rest are, so we call it our acoustic worship project. And basically, I've already mentioned my duo partner, Spencer. So we quite often find ourselves um, in a position where we're invited to help people open up their hearts to God through music and worship, but it's usually in a very low key way. So it might be at a a Renovari Institute residency where there's about 50 of us. And so it's an acoustic guitar, maybe a mandolin or a violin. And um, there's absolutely a place for big, energetic, bombastic, uh, you know, kind of singing together, but that's not what we tend to do. We tend to do this sort of uh, quiet, um, you know, I love um, the work that Taze is doing, you know, just, just the way that music can be, it can just be a bit of a can opener in a great way uh, when we're feeling closed off or... When, when our brains aren't engaging the way we want. Music has this way of kind of slipping in the back door, cracking open little little openings. Um, and, and before we know it, we're open to God's love in a way that we didn't even know we were, we were getting into. Um, so I love, I love the way that music can do so many different things, and I'm grateful for all the different things that it can do. But yeah, for me, I particularly gentle music, um, when it comes to worship, simple music that you can sort of um, sink into uh, can be a real a real huge gift. So your question about whether I use music in my own devotional practice is an interesting one because I think a lot of what I've been learning is to mostly be quiet and listen in my own devotional practice, which is been a huge journey for me. I learning to um, learning to be silent with the Lord and not need to have some major spiritual breakthrough <laughs> has been has been a big challenge in my life. Learning to just hang out with God. You know, sometimes people will use that phrase waste time with God. And I still have resistance to that phrase, you know, back from back from learning from your resistances. I always want to like be accomplishing something. Um, So I've mostly been learning to be silent with God. So I haven't used music a ton in my time with God. But, uh, but often an encounter with music will help lead me into that silence, or the silence will produce music uh, in interesting ways. So there's definitely there's definitely a place for music in in that dance we do with the divine for sure. Well, it's a it's a lovely album. Uh, even as we're talking, I'm I'm ready. We're going to give links to everyone to your website and to these beautiful albums. And and uh, I would encourage people to listen and find the things that will feed your spirits. There's there's wonderful work that you've done, and and uh, I know it's fed me. So that's what I pass on with thanks. Thank you. I wanted to ask you a question because I see in the work that you've been doing that you're often helping others who are songwriters and creators, sowing yourself into other people's lives. You've learned a lot and being able to pass it on is a wonderful gift. I'm just curious, you know, a question that comes to mind 
about the creatives that you're feeding. Why do we need them? And are they in fact the canary in the coal mine at this point? Tell me about that important role of the creative, whether it's the musician or the artist. What do you see? Uh, I want to think thoughtfully about what you've asked because it's such an important question. The first thing I would I would actually say is that every human being is creative. You know, you run into people that work in accounting or, or uh, you know, in, in uh, uh, maybe very left brain jobs and they say, oh, I'm not creative. And it's not true. I, I, I think uh, the, you know, the first five words of the Bible are in the beginning, God created. It's like, this is the very first thing the biblical writers want us to know about the character of God is that he's creative. And then they say, and guess what? You're made in his image. You you bear his image. So every every human being is, is creative. And I love, there's a guy named Gary Molander um, who says, if you look at God's creativity, the way it's described at, at the beginning of Genesis, uh, God looks out and he sees a void and he fills that void with something of himself. And so every time we notice a void and we fill that void with something of ourselves, we are exercising the image of God in us or affirming the image of God in us, working out of that image and being creative. And so that can be, you know, you there can be a void that there's no dinner on the dinner table and you fill that void with something edible. That is a highly creative act. Or, you know, there's a void at your business and you come up with a, a you take something of yourself and the way you see the world and you fill that void with an excellent business plan that's highly creative. So that's the first thing I want to say is everybody's creative and everybody's called to live into that creativity. But then I would also say, uh, some folks are artists. They have specific vocations, you know, in film or music or dance or visual art or drama or writing, whatever it is. And they're, that's one of the ways they're specifically called to fill the void. And yes, we need those, those folks. They um, are so important to, um, to us in our journey of becoming human. And we could look at a million different ways that they're important, but a couple I would say is, uh, one is this thing we've been talking about. They help us listen. They help us see uh, these glimmers of God's movement in the world. Uh, I think it was Frederick Buechner who said, God speaks into and out of the thick of our days. You know, Or Milka Mungridge said, um, every happening, great or small, is a parable whereby God speaks to us and the art of life is to get the message. Well, I think artists help us, they help us learn to listen. They, they go, hey, look at this. Check this out. Look at this. Look at this, you know, the way the world is cohering or the, this meaning or this uh, little glimmer of beauty here. And even if they don't mean to, I think they point us towards transcendence. Even if they have no clue that that's what's going on, I think they point us to, you know, in a real sense, uh, beauty will save the world in that it, if we pull on the thread of beauty, I think it always, it will always bring us back to the creator. So they help us look and listen, artists. And then they, I think they also help us, um, I think they help keep hope alive in that they help us uh, have imagination to be able to conceive of new futures, of new ways of living and being together in the world other than the ones that we have now. And conversely, you use that phrase, canaries in the coal mine, they also help us know, they seem to, artists seem to be some of the first people to be able to detect when there is something toxic going on in the culture that that is stifling out the human spirit, that is working against the flourishing of human beings. And so even very dark work has that sort of prophetic look out people kind of kind of role. Um, so I don't know, you've you've just you've you've uh, you've pushed a button that that I could go on for a long time about. But yes, we we need art in the world and we need every single person listening to this conversation to know that they're creative and that they're invited to fill the little voids that they notice with something of themselves as they co-create with God. Folks, as you're listening, I know you're going to want to connect more with Carolyn. Who wouldn't? I mean, this is just so rich, this conversation, and I'm so grateful for it. I think maybe to kind of understand how to connect, it would also be good to hear just a little bit more about Ranavari. I'd like people to know what Ranavari is offering uh, and and then just sort of figure out some of the, the key things that are there. I think 
it, it, it's something I've always heard spoken of with such respect. Renovari is one of those kind of um, almost like a plumb line uh, for good things, for truth, I would say. And not to say it's got all the answers, but I certainly have heard nothing but good things about Renovari. Tell us just a little bit about the work that's happening there and how people might enter into it, how they could participate in some way. Well, thanks for asking about that. Yeah, I would love to invite people to connect. So Renovari was founded um, more than 30 years ago now by Richard Foster. And Richard Foster wrote Celebration of Discipline and Streams of Living Water and um, beautiful book on prayer, many, many great books um, that have been huge, huge helps to me uh, in my life with God. Um, and a, a lot of them about what we can learn from every century of the of the church, uh, you know, not just the last couple hundred years, uh, but from every century of the church about what a flourishing life with God can look like. And, um, and then uh, another author named Dallas Willard got really involved and a whole little sort of band of brothers and sisters started doing this work together to invite people into um, a, a spiritual formation journey where we're just in, invited to be intentional in our life with God. And I got to start working with them. Uh, now I work with Renovari in the US and I started about six years ago. There's also an expression in Canada that I invite people to check out as well. And we're really excited about what they're doing. Uh, but my work with Renovari in the US I work as director of education. So the, the things that I get to oversee are, you already mentioned the Renovari Book Club, which is um, a, a, an online community that also has um, little in-person groups that meet together. It runs from fall to spring every year. We're just, uh, just getting going this year and people can join at any time. So I really encourage them to check it out. We go through four great books every season and kind of a guided experience together. Um, so that's a great way to start to get to know Renovari. We have a weekly digest that's free that people can sign up for. We uh, record lots of podcasts. And then about once a month, I get to host uh, webinars with lots of really interesting and helpful people. Um, we have a new community initiative called the Fellowship of the Burning Heart that's just getting off the ground, which is these little lay communities of people who want to really invest in each other's lives together around kind of a shared uh, rule of life. Uh, and then uh, I've already mentioned the Renovari Institute. That's a, a, a two-year deep dive into formation that I have the privilege of overseeing with a great team of people. And that runs, uh, it always starts August 1st each year. Each cohort is kind of attached to a new city in the US, but you don't have to be from that city. People come from all over the world. And, um, and the deadline to apply for that is always, uh, I think it's February 1st of each year. Um, so that, and I'm probably forgetting lots of other things. Uh, I, I could talk forever about Renovari, but if people want to check it out, just come to renovari.org look for the place on the homepage um, to sign up for the newsletter and just start poking around and, and see what shimmers for you and what you seem to be invited into. And then I believe Renovari Canada, I think it's renovaricanada.ca. I hope that's right. It's either renovaricanada.ca or .com and people should check out that work as well for sure. Oh, I have to tell you, this has just for me been a feast. I, I, I And I think for all our listeners, it's been a feast. There is this fullness in you, Carolyn, and I'm grateful. I'm grateful you give us the time and you'd introduce us to new things. And, and I'm so thankful for the way that Henry has also been a blessing to you. I would encourage those who are listening. We've mentioned many different things. You'll find all of them in the notes of our podcast. And uh, we'd love to introduce you to new books, to new ideas, to things that will make your life rich. Um, and I'll just go back. Maybe the last thought would be really going back to that song about after yeah. this. Just that sense in which our audience right now, they've all shared this experience, whether mm -hmm. they're listening from South Africa or from Japan or from the Philippines or from anywhere in North America. We've shared this experience. Um, and maybe I'll give you the last word. Where do you see us being? Oh. Where do you want to see us go? Hmm. It's a profound question. Well, I think that each of us is invited to go deeper into the heart of God. I was in a conversation yesterday where someone said, uh, you know, there's much, much we don't understand about God's will and about the way things unfold in our earthly experience. But one thing we know is that nothing irredeemable can happen to you. 
Nothing irredeemable can happen to you. Nothing that God can't turn into something beautiful. And I think COVID will turn out to not be irredeemable, to speak in a double negative. I think that, you know, I don't think God sent COVID as some kind of lesson to us. I think we live on a broken planet and all kinds of messed up things happen. But I think God's specialty is bringing beauty out of things we never expected to be beautiful. And so there is this invitation for each one of us as we, you know, we've been in such a season of disorientation. There's this invitation into reorientation deeper into the heart of God, which will bring us closer to each other. Uh, as Henry taught us, you know, the deeper we go into the heart of God, the more solidarity we discover with each other as all of God's little image bearers. Um, so, I, yeah, to everyone listening, just just say yes to that invitation deeper into the heart of God and have a patient expectation because things take a long time. Uh, these seismic changes of the heart take a long time, but have a patient expectation that God will redeem even even and especially the hardest parts of your life into something really beautiful if you'll if you'll give them a chance. So hope and courage, friends. Oh, honestly, this has been such a delightful treat to talk with you, Carolyn. Thank you, thank you. And to learn from you, um, in a sense, how you're navigating this time, how Renovari is navigating this time. I want to tell our listeners, do be sure to go to our website and you'll get all the notes that relate to what we've talked about today. And I especially want to encourage you, go and have a listen to Carol and Aaron's songs. You're you're going to be blessed. You're going to be made rich with, with good things. If you enjoyed today's podcast, we'd be so grateful if you take time to give it a stellar review or a thumbs up or even share it with your friends and family. Be sure and take time to visit our website, There's even a link to books to get you started in case you're new to the writings of Henry Nouwen. Thanks for listening. Until next time. Thanks so much for watching. Be sure to subscribe, give us a thumbs up, or follow us on social media for more Henry Nouwen content. For books, videos, and other resources, or if you'd like to receive free daily Henry Nouwen e-meditations, you can follow the links below.